Having access to Tony Stark's war chest is the envy of the world. A select few have been lucky as all get out to suit up. Who wouldn't want to be a flying tank? Go to sleep, go to sleep. It's not always a picnic, though. The bona fide Iron Man's adventures carry with them a wide swath, so don't be shocked by some of these entries. Do you like the color red? Find out by hitting the subscribe button below. You'll be flying high on all our new CBR videos. You'll be golden. I cried like a baby when you played Cinderella. Peter, that was first grade. Mary Jane Watson. The connection between Tony Stark and Peter Parker is well established. What are you, what are you, what are you doing here? It's about time we met. You been get my emails right? Notably, when Stark recruited the webhead in Captain America Civil War. Yeah, we don't really it's... need to start a conversation. Okay. But did you know that Parker's main squeeze wore some of Stark's high-tech armor? The Spider-Man Armored Fighting Suit version 1.1, or the Iron Spider that had the appearance of an Iron Man arachnid suit, red and gold and full of metal arms. And Mary Jane looked pretty good wearing it. MJ decided to borrow the Iron Spider suit to come to the aid of Iron Man and her beloved Peter as they grappled with the Regent. This wasn't the first time she piloted body armor, so this helped out in the struggle. A struggle that they almost lost if it wasn't for Spider-Man being able to free all of the superheroes that Regent had previously incarcerated. It was a close call, but no one's baby was hurt, and apparently Mary Jane refused to wear any of Stark's suits after this event. Peter's a lucky guy to have a brave girlfriend or wife like that, depending on which storyline you're reading. But we all know that redheads are fiery. Equipping MJ with a smart suit with missiles is either a very good or very bad idea. I need you to wear a surgical mask <laughs> until you're feeling better. Is that okay? That's rude. Pepper Potts. Personal assistant, love interest, whatever. Then what is that? You're wearing this in the house now? It seems that being close to Tony Stark lands you in the hot seat of one of his high-tech suits. We know exactly what pushes Tony's buttons, and being beautiful sure can fast-track this inevitability. Pepper and Stark's intimate relationship has come to the forefront in Marvel's cinematic last two Iron Man movies. Although her heart favored Happy Hogan in the franchise's storied pulp page tales. They got married and adopted children, making a family. But alas, they were later to divorce. It seems that her relationship with Tony Stark is longer lasting. A testament to this was in Taipei when Ezekiel Shane attacked them and Pepper was almost mortally wounded. Similar to Iron Man's origin story, she received shrapnel close to her ticker. This was a launching point to her wearing Stark's suits, and Stark proved that diamonds aren't forever. The Mark 1616 suit dulls that jewel's luster. We guess it's more out of his affection for her that he wants to give her the ultimate protection. In 2009's The Invincible Iron Man No. 10, Dark Reign, she wore the rescue armor to save civilians and take on powerful foes. And we can't forget in Iron Man 3, a modular suit assembled around Pepper during some tense moments in the film. Oh, what are we dealing with here? Weasel Willis. Behind the iron mask, no one can really tell who's wearing it, which can really do damage to Tony Stark's reputation, more so than what he can wreak himself. Weasel Willis is one such identity thief. Stark is out of town during Tales of Suspense Volume 1, Number 65, when Titans clash, representing Stark Industries' new Mangler missile system. Meanwhile, in Flushing, New York, Weasel breaks into a Stark facility and discovers the new briefcase armor. He literally sauntered out of the facility without raising any suspicion. We I reckon that the security guards didn't have Tony's travel itinerary, and when the cat's away, the mice will wreak havoc. True to form and emboldened by his new threads, Weasel carries out a horrendous crime spree. Obviously, Stark caught wind of this, and man, he's not happy and calls Willis via the latest suit. No one besmirches Tony Stark's reputation except Tony Stark, so he gives him an ultimatum, telling him to meet at the Flushing facility. Weasel Willis is happy to oblige. The only bugaboo is that Tony has to wear the Mark I suit. Durable like a tank, but the new suit is a lot more sophisticated, sporting more advanced weapons. He easily goads Willis to spend all of the suit's power so that the real Iron Man can go in for the kill, so to speak. Rejoice! I am Ultimo! The Iron League. A fully stocked and galvanized wardrobe is a very, very good thing when it hits the fan. In 1994's Iron Man issue 300, it was the doomsday robot Ultimo. Say it with us, Ultimo! All right, now that that's out of our system, Ultimo put such a brutal beatdown on Tony Stark that he fell into a coma, fried his artificial brain circuitry. Lucky for him that his closet has more armor than skeletons, and in a pinch, he's willing to share with his friends and enemies. As appetite for destruction unfolds, Tony Stark is locked in an unconscious pitched battle with a proxy entity masquerading as his dad. Stark's brother-in-arms James Rhodey Rhodes, aka War Machine, assembles Happy Hogan, Bethany Cabe, Eddie March, Carl Walker, and Eddie O'Brien to check Ultimo's attack Futura. This motley crew suits up in Iron Man's absence and is collecting
collection of older battle suits and managed to best Ultimo for a while. The millennia old android rallies and whittles them down one by one. Things got so heated that the suit worn by Carl Walker is melted. Tony Stark wins his psychic battle and comes too, dons his new Model 13 armor and races to join the battle, or what's left of it. Stark's state-of-the-art modular weaponry reduces Ultimo into a scrap heap. Sunny Frisco. In some instances, imitation is the only path to obtaining something as cool as one of Tony Stark's badass suits. In the Secret Wars 2099 miniseries, Sunny Frisco was portrayed as a mirror image to Tony Stark. Or at least they tried to anchor this stake in the ground. However, if they both looked each other in the mirror, they wouldn't be staring back eye to eye. Frisco was afflicted with a form of dwarfism. Sonny isn't a dummy, but he doesn't match Stark's intellect, though. That was the main reason that Sonny was hired by Miguel Stone, the CEO of Alchemax, and he earned a slot in the company's private super-powered team. His contribution was inventing a copycat Iron Man armored suit and even stealing the name. Iron Man. Now we can take solace in the fact that Sonny Frisco is basically ripping Iron Man off and that his suit isn't a trademarked Stark Iron Man suit, so double down on this pint-sized imposter. Here's what I need. A laptop, a digital watch, a cell phone, the pneumatic actuator from your bazooka over there, a map of town, a big spring, and a tuna fish sandwich. Eddie March. When you were a kid, we bet that you wanted to be friends with the kids with the coolest toys. Being buddy-buddy with Stark is the biggest score of them all. Eddie March, a champion boxer from humble beginnings, hung up his gloves due to a medical issue, and the medical bills were eating his savings. Going broke, his old sparring partner, Happy Hogan, lands him a job at Stark Industries. Good career move, because he earned Tony's trust, learning that he's Iron Man, and earned Stark's stand-in slot when needed. Stark needed a reprieve for the sake of his heart, so he gave Eddie a crash course in operating the body armor. When Eddie subbed for Stark, he took on the likes of the Crimson Dynamo, Dr. Spectrum, also known as Obatu, and they both bested him in these face-offs. However, March's participation earned him the gift of an Iron Man suit. Cha-ching! However, Eddie didn't count on becoming the second freak. In an altercation with Thor, Stark activated the Enervator to subdue his friend before real harm came to March. Well, that backfired. Eddie was transformed into the monstrous freak. Stark in his armor diffused the situation by knocking him out. Ha! Glass jaw. I am sorry, you are... Haunting. Deadpool. You thought that we would have pinned Deadpool to the pole position, but we thought that we'd chill a bit on his recent accolades. He's still the best. Of course, Wilson's being invited to all the swank parties, including whooping it up with Tony Stark. In 2016, he got on the guest list as the party raged. Three sheets to the wind, Deadpool nags Stark for the keys to his suit so he can take it out for a spin. In the case of Deadpool's friendly persuasion, this denoted clubbing Tony over the head with a bottle. While the unconscious Stark saw some Zs, Deadpool absconds with his suit. Deadpool continues the party above the city. Public service announcement. Don't drink and fly. Although Deadpool doesn't live by our legal code. During his high-flying adventure, he thwarts an armored truck theft and prevents a nuclear meltdown at a local energy plant. Deadpool never fails at being the life of the party. But after this stunt, he'd find himself in the doghouse or tossed to the curb. Either option, maybe this joyride was good enough as a one-off. Deadpool needs boundaries, as having his super regenerative body encased in impervious armor might make him a bit more brash than he already is. Sorry, son. Look, just give me a chance. Steve Rogers. Captain America's influence on the established Marvel history arc is well established in comics and cinematic blockbusters. He would still help in bringing home the win in World War II, but not as Captain America. In the What If series edition Bullet Points, Steve Rogers' destiny is rewritten. Bullet Points poses the question, what if Steve Rogers didn't undergo Dr. Abraham Erskine's super soldier experimentation? And the writer, J. Michael Straczynski, threw an ever greater curveball when a German spy kills him and Peter Parker's Uncle Ben. The domino effect results in mothballing Project Rebirth and greenlighting Project Iron Man. In this topsy-turvy world, Steve Rogers is admitted into Project Iron Man, but he has to wear the suit for keeps. The project dictates that he has to be fused to the suit. That's gotta be uncomfortable. But as Rogers knows, no pain, no gain. The throes of World War II sucks Rogers into the conflict, and as expected, he helps defeat the Nazi war machine. Even stranger to this weird litany is how Parker turns into the Hulk and subsequently kills him. This What If edition proposes some wacky but entertaining distractions of a parallel Captain America lifeline. Lesson one, never take your eye off the- oh! 
Happy Hogan. We guess that Iron Man's playboy lifestyle includes a circle of friends that have been boxers. Well, Happy was the conduit for Eddie March's employment at Stark Industries, as well as Tony Stark's stand-in whenever Tony needed assistance. In 1963's Tales of Suspense No. 45, Happy Hogan happened to rescue Stark from a near-fatal car crash, because Tony's reckless like that. In the process, Stark revealed his identity as Iron Man to Happy. Tony also gave him the position as his chauffeur and bodyguard. And of course, things begin to get, uh freaky onward from here. Happy is one of three humans that have been transformed into the freak, which occurred some issues later, number 74 to be exact. However, in Hogan's second time as the towering freak, a fainting Pepper Potts gets drawn into the drama, but Iron Man lures Happy back to his lab and hits the freak with the enervator. Problem solved. Unlike in Iron Man 3, Jon Favreau's depiction of Happy Hogan never did fly like an Iron Eagle. That was the comic incarnation's perk. Apart from these two examples, he suited up with Stark, usually as a deacon. We're not picky, though. If any of us fumbled into this career path, we wouldn't complain to being Stark's second stringer. It's so hard for me to believe that she's someone's aunt. Yeah, well, we come in all shapes and sizes, you know. Aunt May. Wow, wow, wow. Aunt May is probably the last person that would ever be caught dead, let alone alive and old, in a Stark suit. But when push comes to shove, Aunt May's down for pretty much anything, like breaking into Doctor Doom's castle in Latveria. Yup, in Marvel Knights Spider-Man Volume 1 Number 20 Retreat. Alongside the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, Aunt May and Mary Jane infiltrated Doom's fortress, the ladies wearing Stark suits. Staying on point to the mission, they find a time machine within and travel back to Peter's parents' final departure from May's house in Queens. Granted, this was a downer for Parker, but he had the chance to see Uncle Ben again from his childhood. As they return to the present day, the three of them are confronted by some Doom bots. The battle that ensued had Spider-Man at a disadvantage because of his condition in the series' run. Mary Jane and Aunt May swooped into the fray wearing the older Iron Man suits. Well, you go, girl. Maybe she'll slip into an Iron Man suit after being seduced by Stark. Don't tell Aunt May. Or take Parker's suit out for a spin. I have successfully privatized world peace. Now you tell us if it's stupid for Tony Stark to be so loose with his suits. He rewards his friends with access, but so too his enemies. Is Tony too reckless with his tech? What do you think? Should Tony cool his jets? Let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for subscribing to CBR.